record. Okay, recording in progress. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jeremy Robichaud. I'm the uh, reference librarian here at the Maynard Public Library. Tonight, we're delighted to uh, again welcome David Mark um, on uh, tonight's uh, topic, which is of course, Henry David Thoreau and especially focusing on his walk from Concord uh, to Lake Boone, um, including the area that um, would later become Maynard. David is a member of the town's sesquicentennial steering committee and has been hosting this um, local history um, series. Um, again, this is the, the seventh uh, in the series. And uh, the next uh, presentation is going to be on uh, Thursday, September 30th. It'll be uh, on Maynard Schools Through the Centuries. And that program will highlight um, the 10 schools that Maynard has had through the years and uh, also the five, fi uh, five fires that, that um, those schools have experienced uh, through um, Maynard's uh, history of education. So uh, more uh, information about uh, the upcoming programs, uh, those, those links to the previously recorded programs and, and sign up forms. Uh, uh, you can find all that stuff at um, maynardpubliclibrary.org slash may150, that's lowercase m-a-y 150. And for more information about the, the sesquicentennial and um, all the upcoming stuff that they have going on, like the parade that's um, being planned, uh, if you go to maynard150.org, you can find uh, all that stuff and uh, merchandise and uh, David's book and um, uh, other things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to David. Okay. Uh, you you're out. Okay. All right. So, um... First, I want to do a, a, a plug for the book. So if you haven't yet acquired a copy of Made in Massachusetts, A Brief History, this is available for sale at Six Bridges Gallery at 77 Main Street at a cost of $22. And all that proceedings goes to the town of Maynard to help pay for the sesquicentennial events we've been having this year. Um, secondly, I think at the last month's talk, I'd mentioned that at one point I had been somewhat proficient in bugle. Of course, the talk was about Maynard's history of music. So I've actually found my Boy Scout bugle. I'm now going to play one note and set it aside. Um, a few days ago, I, I tried playing uh, taps on the bugle. And um, my lovely wife, Jean D'Amico, said, David, you hit all the right notes just not in the right order. So let's just leave that bugle retired. I do want to say that I've been writing a history column for the Beacon Villager since 2009. Over the years, I've actually composed four columns related to Thoreau, uh, his 19, 1851 walk through what later became Maynard, his lecture turned essay, uh, Walking, um, a poem, The Old Marlboro Road, uh, will these things be mentioned in today's talk, and the role his younger sister, Sophia, played in securing his posthumous fame. Um, I presented some of this at actually the Thoreau Society annual meeting in 2018. And parts of what I'm talking about are not in this book, but are in my 2014 book, Hidden History of Maynard Under Unusual People. So now I'm gonna to move to the slides. Let's see if I can remember how to get us to um, share screen. Pick this, share, slideshow. And there we are. Can everyone see the slide? Yes. And the slide is unobstructed, Jeremy? Yes, looks great. OK. All right. So. First, I'm going to say I'm a big fan of walking myself, and I tend to average um, one and a half miles per day, occasionally touching three or four miles per day, mostly wander around Maynard, occasionally getting outside the borders. But almost all of that is on Maynard's uh, woodland trails and rail trail. And I suggest that everyone spend some time outside. It's very therapeutic to be out there among the trees. Um, okay, we do this. So just to recap the sesquicentennial celebrations, this is the 150th anniversary of the creation of Maynard. Today's Zoom talk will be available on the Maynard Public Library uh, YouTube channel. On the 19th, weather permitting at 1 p.m., there will be a parade. Details will be posted on Facebook and the website for the sesquicentennial committee. 
and COVID Willing, a Maynard History exhibit of items from the collection of the Maynard Historical Society will be on display at the library for November, and the book will be for sale there also. Okay, we now, if we know our town a bit, we know that next to 7-Eleven slash Dunkin' Donuts, you'll see this mural on the side of what was once the Murphy and Snyder building. And it shows Henry David Throw gazing out of the window with Babe Ruth below in a Red Sox uniform, standing there, bat, socks in hand and hat. And you wonder why these two people, why and why and why? And the answer is, this was painted in 2018. This is historically accurate. Both Henry David Throw and Babe Ruth actually were present at this intersection, different times Throw walked through in 1851. Why the Babe? Well, when he was still a Red Sox pitcher before he was sold to the Yankees, he spent, um, I think, two winter off seasons uh, renting a cabin in Sudbury and he and his wife would drive the town. Um, they'd stop at shop at the Woolworths, they'd stop at the groceries, and uh, he would also stop off at the cigar store. And at times he would come back in town later without his wife for um, some pretty serious drinking. The building actually had originally been constructed as a branch store of the United Cooperative Society in 1936. Murphy and Snyder occupied the site from 1957 to 2003 and has actually has stood empty um, since then. Okay, the walk on September 4th, 1851, and we know this from his journal entry, Henry David Thoreau and William Ellery Channing, Concord neighbor, former classmate at Harvard, went for a walk from Concord to Boone's Pond and back. Now, by the way, legally, his name was David Henry Thoreau, named after his uncle David, but since everyone tend to refer him as Henry, he after college decided he would be known as Henry David Thoreau, even though he never legally took that name. And as a uh, side note, the family pronounced it Thoreau, but since so many people seem to feel that Thoreau is better, we're gonna stick with Thoreau for today. So with an 8 a.m. start, they started the route west and I took them um, in parts down the powder mill road, past the gunpowder mill, past the paper mill. And that point, instead of actually crossing the bridge over the Assabet, they turned left, i.e. south on what is now 27, and then west again onto Old Marlboro Road, still so named in Maynard as such, went through uh, what is now the Assabet River National Wildlife Refuge and on their way to Boone's Pond. Boone's Pond at that point had not yet been dammed by Emory Maynard for reserve water supply for the woolen mill. So it was a smaller area uh, than what is now known as Lake Boone. Thoreau repeatedly said he disliked retracing and outgoing routes. They came back along the railroad, crossed north at White Pond Road Bridge, a bridge having been at that site since 1715, um, summited Summer Hill and traipsed Concord Room home. No mention of what time they finished, nor have they eaten anything along the way. So there's our background and where they went. So it's Powder Mill Road because there was a gunpowder mill um, built on the act, what became the Acton Maynard border once Maynard was created. The gunpowder mill was in operation from 1835 to 1940. Um, Keystone you haven't heard me speak about this before. There were fairly frequent explosions. Um, occasionally workers had to show up the next day and, and try to collect body parts in buckets. So they can have a closed casket funeral. It was a dangerous job, but it paid well. This is actually the dam, which is now on um, 62 near the Subaru site. And it was built in what's called a cascade style where there's a series of, of uh, stones sort of stepping the water down on the uh, downhill side. And this is still active, actually an active dam. It's privately owned and the owner uses it to generate electricity, which he sells to Concord. So this started out as a sawmill in 1880 um, and with some repairs of the dam and the dike, it is still in operation uh, 220 years later. I do wanna say that the buildings were scattered. So what was actually here at this main site was the grinding process that grinded the ingredients separately. But once you started mixing them, they could become explosives. So they were then moved to 
separate small buildings at some distances from each other. So if any one building blow up, it wouldn't blow up the whole operation. Now, what you see here on the left are vertically mounted grinding stones. And these mixed the three dampened ingredients for up to hours. So the, the two wheels would rotate and the dish they're in would also rotate um, grinding and a person would be stationed here to make sure it stayed damp. Um, there would have been walls on this. The walls were deliberately flimsy. So if there was, let's call it a minor explosion, it would blow off the walls, but not down by the heavily reinforced uh, structure held together by these beams and iron rods. Uh, now, in this case, this one had not exploded, but things were being dismantled. They took off the sides first. Um, there is at another site, one of these that had been blown up. The beams are asunder, the iron rods are bent. And what you see on the right is one of the grinding stones estimated as somewhere between three and four tons. It had blown some distance of yards out of the building and it's embedded in the ground there still as, as a sign that this was definitely a, a dangerous occupation. This stone is interesting because the grooves that you see in it had nothing to do with gunpowder. This was originally a grain grinding millstone. There would have been two stones horizontally mounted and the grain would be ground between them and move out towards the outside edges. But the stone was taken, repurposed vertically, hence the iron rods bent um, and was used edge on for gunpowder. Another staggered stone mill. Now, if any of you are aware of this, this is, this is just upstream from the Wal Waltham Street Bridge. Uh, basically puts it next to McDonald's. And this was the dam for the paper mill. The paper mill predates the woolen mill. This was a paper mill created in 1820. Again, had a staggered stone face and was known as the Falls. And even though the paper mill had gone out of business in the 1880s, the dam was left intact until it was washed out by the flood of 1927, which also severely damaged um, um, the bridge, Waltham Street Bridge. And that bridge had to be replaced in uh, 28 and then has recently been replaced again. So this was referred to as the falls. In looking at this, and imagine what you have on the far right is where McDonald's is now. The white building that you actually see in the picture is where Jimmy McDonald has created an apartment building out of brick. And the dark building in the back was called the um, music hall and also uh, the rink because there was a uh, roller skating there and basketball and dances. And this burned down and then has was replaced by Bowling Lanes, which is now a marijuana dispensary. So each of these pictures has a bit of ongoing history. We see Old Marlboro Road, and again, with the, uh, the Maynard um, uh, insignia on it. And this is what leads into the now dead ends into the Forest Preserve. The reason it's called Old Marlboro Road is that even at Thoreau's time in 1851, this had been replaced by a newer road further to the south because this road was through wetlands and between ponds and was continuously flooding, um, flooded over, iced over, mud season, hard to maintain, being washed out. So the original road would have been built between Concord and Marlboro in the probably mid 1600s and was long abandoned by the time Thoreau was walking down it and writing his poem about old Marlboro Road. Sections, however, now exist both in Concord and Maynard with the name Old Marlboro Road. Now, if you see this as the map of the Assabet River National Wildlife Refuge, um, let's see if I can. So, on the upper right side, you see Bose Pond, and this is Old Marlboro Road. Can, can people see my arrow, Jeremy? Nod if yes. Okay. Yes. So, this is a, a little parking area, and it's now called Winterberry Way within the wildlife refuge. Uh, the access to it is from this road. There's the center here with parking bathrooms, but it continued on this side, crossed past this white pond, which by the way, even though outside of Maynard, Maynard owns rights to as its water, water supply and used it as its water supply before it installed all the wells and continued all the way to Marlboro where it is known as Concord Road. So this was the route. <clears throat> And I don't know if most of you are aware when you think of it being in the wildlife refuge, but almost a third of it is still actually closed to the public. Uh, and only this part has been opened up with trails and paths through it. 
why is it winterberry way? Well, most of you may know, some of you may know that winterberry is actually related to holly and has bright red berries which develop in the fall and persist through the winter. So these are pictures taken from our yard that show these berries developing and then encased in ice in the winter. And interestingly, they remain through the winter, hence winterberry, until robins return in the spring and eat them. So either robins or cedar waxwings eat these, but the resident winter birds that stay, uh, the blue jays and crows do not. So winterberry was so named and um, very pretty. And you'll see this in the wilds and also as a garden plant. Thoreau mentioned that he was passing the site of what had been Rice Tavern owned by the Rice family. This had been at a crossroads because the two major roads, the road going from Concord to Marlboro and another road going from Sudbury to Lancaster crossed at this site and there was a family tavern. But once the uh, Marlboro Road fell into disuse, um, the tavern itself was returned to being a family farm by the Vos family. And the house remained until 1942 when the area was seized by the army to make a munitions uh, uh, storage area and the house was torn down. If you do go through this, you'll see Puffer Pond. Uh, the Puffer family themselves settled this area in 1743. Now, occasionally you'll notice in areas where there's water that there's what they're referring to as drowned trees or a drowned forest. You can also see this as heading south towards Sudbury in 27. What has happened here is that an area that was relatively dry and supported trees has become so consistently wet that the trees have died. Sometimes this is just because there's now more rain and the water table has risen or a road was created cutting off the drainage from the area. So this is an area clearly that has changed over time and you still see these standing um, dead trees representing a former forest. As to why he was heading towards Boone's Pond, that's Ellery and, and, and Throw. Matthew Boone was the very first settlers of this area in the mid 1600s and was um, killed by the Native Americans as part of uh, Medawan's War, which is also known as King Philip's War. So the Native Americans uh, destroyed most of the communities west of Concord, including burning and sacking Sudbury and a couple of people who had early settled Stowe, including Boone, a man named Kettle, uh, were killed by Native Americans. And this monument is near Boone's Pond at this point. It obviously wasn't there when Thoreau was there. Coming back, the two of them are now walking along the railroad. And what you're seeing here is the Ben Smith Dam, um, taken by me standing actually smack in the middle of the river because in the dead of summer drought time, flow of the river is reduced to as much as maybe 10 or 15 cubic feet per second, basically this trickle you see over the dam. And um, none of the water is then diverted into the mill pond and, and all the water sort of meanders through uh, Maynard and goes out the other side. The dam was constructed after Amory Maynard and William Knight arrived here with pockets full of money in 1846. Their genius was to look at the Aspet River as a steep river, able to support several mills up and down the river. And there was a mill on Mill Street, which was a combination sawmill and grain mill. They bought that mill, they bought the water rights. And then what they said is, we're gonna move the dam half a mile upriver. We're gonna create a new mill. The new mill is gonna be half a mile downriver. We're gonna connect the two by a canal and the canal will fill a mill pond and the mill pond will power the mill. By doing this, and by buying up five miles of water rates, including creating Lake Boone as a temporary water retaining area, they were able to have a year round supply of water and a larger vertical drop, able to power uh, a very effective set of water wheels where the water went over the top and pushed down the blades. And they had tremendous amounts of power out of this to create the woolen mill, to grow the woolen mill, Starting 1847, they're selling carpet. Um, we hear that they had contracts to make uh, uniform cloth and blankets for the Union Army uh, during the Civil War. We know shortly after the Civil War, when 1850, the railroad came thin. And, and shortly after the end of the Civil War, they started adding steam power because the river was no longer sufficient. 
they still needed the river for the water supply to wash the wool, to clean it, and then to wash the wool, to wash out the excess dye after the dyeing process. So they retained the dam, the canal, and the mill pond, even though by, by the 1870, they were getting most of their power uh, from steam. And even the paper mill, because their image is the paper mill, had added uh, steam engines and a chimney and was also getting its power from steam. So the transition from water to steam, but the dam remain, and the dam remains to this day, even though it has no function. It is an obsolete dam. It is called the Ben Smith Dam because the Smith family owned most of what later became Maynard. And we had Amory Maynard, William Knight, buying up hundreds of acres of land from the Smith family, perfectly happy to take good payment in cash uh, for this land. Uh, but uh, Ben Smith said, no, I think the name has been have to be named after me, and so it is. When we think of walking along the railroad, walking actually between the tracks is a bit tough because you've got the railroad ties there, and it's a bit awkward. But when this was a working railroad, the sides would have been well cleared, uh, mostly to reduce the risk of fire, because with steam engines, there's a tremendous amount of cinder and ember coming out of that smokestack, even though the steam from the pistons is also diverted to the smokestack. So um, that's a large amount of fire prevention. It didn't, wasn't 100%, there were still hot embers. So usually for maybe 10, 15 yards on either side, the area was kept clear of growth. You can see here, obviously, um, the railroad stopped functioning in summer in the 1960s, trees were going up between the rails, but this is became the now the Massabit River Rail Trail. But you can see this section through woods, <coughs> Actually, you almost have backyards on either side of this, but it just really feels that you can step out of the center of Maynard and you can be in a forest um, almost immediately and enjoy your pleasant walk. The rails are gone, the ties are gone. Um, it's now paved and 12 feet wide and um, nicely maintained by the Department of Public Works who will um, commit to blowing the leaves off the trail, but will not commit to clearing the snow off the trail. So winters, it's there for um, uh, cross-country skiing and snowshoeing or hiking in the snow, but it's really hard to consider that as a bicycle commute to get to the train station in the dead of winter. I want to say that Thoreau often walked along railroad tracks, and you have to realize that when he was at Walden, on the other side of the pond, this same railroad existed, the railroad that connected the South Acton train station um, going in towards Boston. So he was hearing trains, 10, 15 trains a day going by on the other side of the pond. And he could walk along that of those tracks to get to Concord because he would go to town, um, sometimes have a meal with his family to bring his laundry to his parents and get his laundry done, perhaps to read the newspaper and then get back to his cabin in the woods. He imagined actually that he was walking so often along the rail trail that he sort of imagined that train engineers might mistake him for a track repairer employee. Um, here we are at, at this point, the brand new rail trail at White Pond Road Bridge, the Maynard Stow Line to the west end of the trail. This section, you'll see it's marked at mile 0, 0.00, is 3.4 miles from here to the Acton train station and passes um, a number of park areas in Maynard. So you've got Ice House Landing with the canoe and kayak launch. You've got um, Tobin Park, which is where the footbridge is over the Aspet River, and a soon-to-be park at the Marble Farm site across from Christmas Motors. Um, this fall, uh, there will be construction there to make that an official town park, cleaning it up, taking out the dead trees and brush, putting a couple of benches and a fence around the foundation of the Marble family, who had moved there in 1705, making them, again, one of the earliest settlers in Maynard. And the same family lived on that site for over 200 years. When they made the left-hand turn here and crossed the bridge and went up to the top of Summer Hill and looked out. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been on top of Summer Hill right now. It's a forest. You're not going to see anything. But in his time, and actually well into the 1950s, that was a pasture. It's ringed by stone walls. Um, it was where uh, cattle were pastured, and it was clear. Uh, you could go up there and you had a beautiful site because that's the highest point in Maynard. And as a matter of fact, in World War II, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, 
the people of Maynard wanted to do something for the war effort. So they built a airplane sighting tower on top of Summer Hill. Tower about 30 feet tall, platform at the top, so that volunteers could be there watching out for enemy planes. And this was their effort, their contribution to the war for World War II. There was one fallacy in this, and you have to realize that Germany had no aircraft carriers whatsoever. There was never going to be a German plane flying off the Atlantic coast and bombing things. There was no purpose whatsoever for an airplane observation tower. And yet there was until, I think it burned because many things burned in Maynard, including as Jerry mentioned, a number of schools. However, no churches, but still we had a number of significant church fires. We're now turning to walking because Thoreau's gotten home. He complained a bit about uh, how he couldn't wash in the river because it became a bit stagnant because of Knight's New Dam. But he did get home, finished his walk, wrote in his journal. One of the points he made was that the uh, telegraph had just reached Concord that week. So you could be in Concord and be connected to the world by telegraph. Now, we're talking now about walking. Thoreau was, I'm going to say, dead serious about walking. He first publicly read on this topic was in Concord in 1851. In 1851, 1860, he read from this piece a total of 10 times more than any of his other lectures. He was conflicted, by the way, of a sense that he needed to entertain audiences when all he really wanted to do was inform. But he sort of reached a compromise, but he was, he was unhappy with this need to try to sort of be entertaining. Um, I have no problem with that personally. Walking, by the way, was published in June of 1862, issue of the Atlantic Monthly, shortly after his death from tuberculosis at the age of 44. The essay's length is slightly more than 12,000 words. Uh, you can find full copies of it online. I'm gonna say it's, it's worth reading. As a bonus today, after our question and answer period, I'll be reading some of the extended quotes about walking from Thoreau. So please stay with us. You'll see a few of the shorter pieces here. By the way, the Concord Library has the original handwritten document. It's mostly in Henry's hand with some markups, um, but parts were fair copy written by Sophia, his sister, because he became too ill to write. I have sat there in the Concord Library uh, wearing white cotton gloves, very happily looking at the original handwritten essay, Walking. When I say he was dead serious about walking, these are some excerpts of those quotes. If you are ready to leave father and mother and brother and sister and wife and child and friends and never see them again, if you have paid your debts and made your will and settled all your affairs and are a free man, then you are ready for a walk. He also added that I think I cannot preserve my health and spirits unless I spend four hours a day at least and commonly more than that sauntering through the woods and over the hills and fields, absolutely free from all worldly engagements. So his day, his day was usually some form of work in the morning. By lunchtime, he was settling out. He was living with his parents in Concord and he was ready to set out. He said he often stepped out of the door and stood there for five, 10 or 15 minutes trying to decide which way to go and then would head off and you know, might get home after it was dark. Sometimes he decided, a night walk, especially if the moon was up, might be the right thing to do. And he would head out well after dark and, and spend a couple of hours wandering through the woods in the dark, lit only by moonlight. He did say, I am alarmed when it happens. I walked a mile into the woods bodily without getting there in spirit. In my afternoon walks, I would fain forget all my morning occupations and my obligations to society. These are four lines from Thoreau's poem, The Old Marlboro Road, as first composed in his journal 1850, and last they included in his possibly published essay in 1862. And the point here is he spent his mornings working, perhaps, um, and we'll get to what he did when he called it working. He spent his afternoons walking, and he spent his evenings pretty much spending hours uh, writing his journal, which he often mined for future publications, his talks, his poetry, his essays, so his journal was a source book for him uh, for times going forward. So he's saying here, if with fancy unfurled, you leave your abode, you may go round the world by the old Marlboro Road.
Okay, let's actually back up for a moment. When I first read this, I was very taken by the very first line, not shown here, where they once dug for money but never found any, first two lines. And I thought this might have been reference to a Maynard uh, mythological story of buried treasure, because again, he had walked through the area of Maynard in 1851. Um, and there are stories about mysterious strangers who stayed briefly at the Thomas Smith family farm, um, not too far from Old Marlboro Road. But what Thoreau was actually writing about was buried treasure stories tied to the Concord end of the Old Marlboro Road. He had journal entries mentioning money digger shore as along the Subway River in Concord near what is now Emerson Hospital. He mentioned that if you walked there, you'd find pits dug in the ground where obviously someone or some group thought they had a map, thought they had a place where they're gonna find the treasure. And he just loved the imagination of the, these uh, adult men out there with this fanciful idea that they were gonna find buried treasure. So we get to throw, this actually is a photograph taken in 1856, he was 39 at the time. And also the 1967 stamp, both showing what we're gonna to have to refer to as his neck beard, because he was keeping his chin clearly shaven, but allowed the beard to go below his neck. Um, I don't think this is a handsome look, but it's definitely a singular look for him. The bicentennial stamp issued a few years ago defocuses the neck beard. Uh, it's painted by Sam Weber using, again, that photo as a model. Uh, with some sumac leaves in it. And we're now at the two, you know, bit past the 200th year of his birth and he has become basically an icon uh, for naturalists everywhere. I wanna mention a bit more about the Thoreau family. So Henry, excuse me. Henry had one brother and two sisters. None of them married. All of them at the times were employed as teachers. Two died before him. John of Tetanus at age 27 in 1842. That was before the Walden stint. And Helen of tuberculosis at age 37 in 1849, um, after the Walden stint, but before he actually wrote about Walden and published it. Sophia survived Henry, being the last of the family to die in 1876 of tuberculosis tuberculosis, which is also uh, what Henry died of at age 44. John Throw, their father had died in 1858. Um, that was four years before Henry and Cynthia Dunbar Throw, his mother had died in 1872, 10 years after the Throw siblings. All of them were descendants through their mother of Mayflower passenger, Richard Warren. So um, Throw and his sister could be daughters and sons of the American Revolution and uh, of the Mayflower. All of the Thoreau siblings attended Concord Ad Academy, rare in those times for being a co-educational private school. Only Henry went to college, Harvard, graduating in 1837. Helen and Sophia taught for a while in Roxbury before joining the family in Concord, where their father took up the Dunbar family's pencil and graphite business. She and Henry lived in the family house for the last 12 years of his life. They often boated and walked together. Henry was known at times to bend down a branch and inscribe a few words on the leaf and then let it return up into the air. He said that these were his poems to heaven. Sophia, also an ardent naturalist, often bringing home leaves to flatten in a leaf press. Here in 1868, she wrote parts of one of Henry's poems on the dried leaves of a shagbark uh, stem. Henry actually wrote two poems titled Fair Haven. So in 1868, she inscribed her name in the first, third, and fifth stanzas of one poem on those leaves. This item is also in its original in the Concord Library. Um, Fairhaven Bay itself is a wide section of the Sudbury River, uh, miles upstream from where the Concord and Sudbury merge. Uh, it's flanked by cliffs on the east side and was a favorite place for many people from Concord to picnic. So the third verse <clears throat> is, if there's a cliff in this wide world, Step, a stepping stone to heaven, a pleasant craggy shorthand cut, it sure must be fair haven. And the last verse, and when I take my last long rest and quiet sleep in, what kinder covering for my breast than the warm turf fair haven. 
against this politically expressed wish, Henry and his family were all buried in Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Concord. Thoreau also penned a forgettable poem titled The Assabet, which I'm not gonna to bother to show you any of. I do wanna mention he later repurposed two chunks of that poem uh, two 10 line portions of that, a separate poems in his 1849 book, A Week on the Concord Merrimack Rivers. Okay, we mentioned pencils. Point was that Thoreau family was in the pencil business from 1823 onward, and this paid in part for Henry's education. Um, Henry's father um, had joined with his brother-in-law Dunbar in a pencil business and pencils were made from graphite. The graphite was very pure. It was just cut into a slab, uh, tied or bound or glued between two pieces of wood and you're using that as a coarse rough, rough made pencil. Um, if it was not that fine, the graphite had to be ground and then mixed with some sort of substance that would bind it and again encased in wood. But these were often fragile, chunky, broke easily and was poor quality. Henry himself made several innovations that result in these being the, the best pencils made in America. What he either read from what was being done in Europe or discovered on his own was that you could mix very finely ground graphite with clay and then heat it to make a shaft of graphite mixed with clay of varying hardness depending on the ratio of graphite to clay. And you got pencils numbered one, two, three, and four, as you see in the advertisement of the Throws Improved Drawing Pencils. On the right, you see a bundle of 12 with a throw label of it, um, John Throw and Company, Concord Mass. And this <clears throat> sort of became the family business. And the production was actually in a shed behind their house on Concord Street with a few employees turning out pencils, uh, sort of a, a crafts business. Now, if Henry had been of an entirely different mental bent, he could have expanded this. The business could have become a large pencil making factory somewhere perhaps on the Aspet River and the Thoreau family would have been rich and the pencils would have been known throughout the country as Thoreau pencils. He didn't care. All he really wanted to know was that, that there was enough income coming in to keep the family in sort of an upper middle class lifestyle. No one had to work anymore. People came in and made pencils and, and that was the end of any ambition because that was not his ambition. Uh, he also laid up, took up surveying, which was again, a job he could do in the morning, uh, freelance. He was basically a freelance surveyor. He did surveying around Concord and other towns. He did surveying of the rivers. And, and again, something that he could pick up, leave, do, not do. It kept him at his leisure and it kept the rest of his family at his leisure. And, and that was the family um, business. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna turn off the screen share. We're gonna come back here and Jeremy, you're gonna take us through some questions. Okay, um, I don't see that anybody has any questions in the chat yet, but uh, now is a good time. If you uh, would like to ask questions, you can either put them in the chat or uh, in Zoom, you do have the ability to uh, raise your hand and you can just ask your question uh, directly. Oh, uh, actually, I think Bob has a question. Uh, go ahead, Bob, you're on. Now, there's more a, a comment and a question. Um, I, yeah, um, it was a great talk, David. I really appreciated it. And I'm glad you brought up about the railroad because when the railroad came by Walden Pond, um, the, a lot of Irish immigrants were working on building the railroad. And when they would lay down track in a certain place, they would move on. And actually a good part, part of Thoreau's cabin was from an uh, Irish uh, shanty that was owned by a man named James Collins. So he bought that shanty and that became part of his cabin at Thoreau. The other thing, the other kind of um, important thing about the railroad was, uh, as you pointed out, Thoreau's, uh, Thoreau's sisters and mother were ab abolitionists, so was Henry. Henry was a conductor on the Underground Railroad and many times placed a runaway and saved person on a, mm -hmm. on a train towards Pittsburgh, ultimately to Vermont and Canada. So it wasn't really a question, it was just kind of mentioning how important the railroad was in many ways to the town of Concord and Henry in particular. 
Okay, I'll add to that that he sort of condensed his two years and two months at Walden to sort of his book where he talked about he, he the four seasons of the year. And one of the points he made in winter is, as again, uh, the Irish descended on the pond in the middle of winter. Uh, I think it might have been February, and and basically cut off all the ice off the top of the pond. He basically referred to them as, as farmers harvesting a crop and, and hauling away the ice. And this was typical of the ice business um, all throughout New England. Uh, usually once a year, ice was cut when it was 12 to you know, 15 inches thick and stored in ice houses. And, and then we know Maynard had uh, what became Maynard and actually afterwards Maynard had a number of ice houses on the Aspen River, had an ice house on the mill pond um, and the bent ice house um, basically upstream of the dam, had the ice come in one side and the other side faced the railroad. So it was loaded out the other side onto the train and hauled away off into ships that were then taking it down to the Caribbean, to Havana, to New Orleans, uh, where stored in ice houses there and ice was sold in tropical climates. So uh, the railroad was very much in Henry's life um, and he acknowledged it and uh, he wrote about it at some length. Yeah, I think he mentioned somewhere in his writings that because the ice from Walden was being transported to tropical climates, he said, the water of Walden mixes with the water of the Ganges. So and that seems almost like hyperbole, but in truth, Boston shippers actually shipped ice to India. Ice yeah. was shipped from Boston to India and, and, and sold to the basically the British Empire in India. So it, it had a kernel of truth. When he wrote this, he was writing the truth. His ice, his water from Walden Pond could have ended up in the Ganges. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Um, next question comes from Jan. Uh, do you know if the 20 mile distance uh, was typical of Thoreau's walks? Uh, were, was there any special motivation for his walk uh, to what is now Maynard Stowe? He ambled off in all directions. He, he tended to actually prefer to go west because west was not wilderness. It was mostly abandoned farms and pasture. You have to realize that um, once mechanized harvesting came into play and railroads, many farmers just abandoned New England farms entirely and said, to hell with this. I'm going to Ohio. It's flat. My horses can pull a reaper. I'm not there waving a scythe, walking up and down the side of a hill. So much of New England, even in his time, was woodland or woodland uh, lots for people who needed wood lots for their home fires or had gone to seed, had gone to meadow, and he's out walking through um, abandoned, once cultivated land, but uh, without the people in it and enjoying it tremendously. Uh, he tended to go, he heard to the West as the wildness. Um, mm. As far as how far he went, you know, he, he wandered occasionally pretty far. He uh, took off one day and headed towards Mount Wachusett, which was about from where he was, about 40 miles each way. I think he stayed at an inn um, somewhere along the way, but he really saw 20 miles as nothing really exceptional, you know, for, for a, a joint. Okay. And, and Maynard was wasn't Maynard at the time, but it was, the point was, it was Asimut Village. And it was a bit of a hamlet. It had a paper mill. It had a gunpowder mill. It had a woolen mill. It had a business. It had a couple of dams. Had three dams. It had stores. It wasn't. Uh, it was. It wasn't nothing. Uh, I'm going to put on uh, Carolyn. You have a question. You're you're on, Carolyn. Oh. Oh hi. Oh. Oh. Do you have any idea how much or what he typically would eat on a long walk, or what he might drink? Um, the answer as best I can ascertain is he would eat nothing and he would drink, he would drink from streams. So he wasn't, obviously he wasn't bringing water, he wasn't bringing a canteen. He was just, um, drinking from streams along the way. And, um, he was perfectly happy not eating for, you know, his four five, six hours of wandering. Wow. No granola bars. No granola bars, <laughs> no energy drinks. No uh, sports drinks. No. That's remarkable that he'd go that that kind of distance with no food, though. No, actually, it's not. It's it's it, it's unless you're running, you're not running negative calories so severely. Yes, you can you can get dehydrated, but trust me, you've, you've got enough body stores uh, of energy mm -hmm. to to get by, you know, a full day without eating. 
um, without getting lightheaded or low blood sugar or anything like that. Maybe he ate some wild foods like blueberries. In season, in season, he was perfectly happy in picking blueberries or blackberries or huckleberries, yeah. Um, One other question. I think at that one point, Steve had a hand up. Oh, um, so when I say raise your hand, I mean there's there's a there's a feature in Zoom where you can if you click on uh, more you can uh, more options you can raise your hand. But um, but or physically, uh, I think Steve Green is Steve, Steve Steve Green physically raised his hand. Okay, let me um unmute him. Okay, let me uh okay Steve. Uh, oh, sorry Steve. Uh, hold on one second. All right, Steve. I think go um go ahead and unmute yourself. There you go. You're on. Okay. Uh, you made, David, you made an early reference to Babe Ruth by way of maybe analogy and something about a couple of cabins. Can you elaborate on that? Off season, a number of the Red Sox players were renting places out in, in um, Sudbury um, for the winter to hunt and fish. And they recommended to this, this, this young pitcher, uh, Babe Ruth and his, his, his wife, that uh, they could do the same. So they rented a cabin out there, they had a car um, and they spent, uh, I think it was two winters and people from Maynard wrote about basically hiking over there to play with Babe Ruth to skate on the pond in front of his house. Um, Babe's, uh, his, his wife would make them all hot chocolate. Uh, the episode with the piano seems to have occurred there. If you, if you follow it truly, it's not his later house when he's with the Yankees. It's this house where they pushed the piano out onto the ice so they basically could be ice skating the music and then they couldn't get the piano back up the hill to the house. They just left it on the pond. So when the pond melted, the piano, piano sank into the pond. Um, that's the truer story I hear, but Babe Ruth definitely spent at least one and likely two and we do know that he occasionally uh, left his wife alone there in this wood heated kerosene lit cabin for the night, headed to town for drinking, occasionally too drunk to drive home safely. So he'd crash in someone's house and go home the next day. Well, I was just confused about whether there were additional buildings. He owned his only property he ever owned in his life was on Dutton Road. It was a substantial house. Yes, yes. And he he uh, resided there for about four years. So, but where are these? Where were these cabins? That yeah, you know, I'm going to have to follow up with that. But it's a cabin singular. It was a small cabin. It's been just since long since destroyed. But it was on a pond in Sudbury, um, and uh, he he didn't own it. He rented it. Okay. And it was when he was with, still with the Red Sox. Hence, the picture shows him in his Red Sox uniform. And by the way, that corner used to be known as Bug House Corner. Uh, for reasons I'm not, not going to go into at this moment, but it was, uh, there was a number of different businesses and, and situations at that corner, but that's where Babe definitely, you know, uh, you know, came to town to shop, came to town to drink, came to town to play pool, came to town to buy cigars. Uh, one of your, one of your historians, I, uh, the name escapes me, an old timer in Maynard, uh, told me one day, we were standing on Nason Street talking and he was telling me about the fact that the babe would bring um, baseballs and bats and uh, gloves out uh, from the from Fenway Park to give to the uh, kids and that they they loved he, that. Yeah, he was he was basically at this point a big kid and he loved playing and the, and the teenagers loved hiking over there and and and, and, and basically hanging out with, with with the babe, you know, and his wife. Um, and uh, it seemed, and he, now he came to town also, one of the cigar shops he stopped at is in the same building as now where the Boston Bean is, it's the other corner of that building. But that was the um, cigar shop where he'd come to town to buy his cigars. Great, thank you, David. Okay, so there was a, a nice digression, but anything back on the bay, back on, on HDT, Thoreau. Um, Jeremy, any questions come in on chat? No other questions on the chat, but certainly if anybody um, wants to raise their hand, um, I'm gonna try to keep an, I'm looking at the actual um, images of people, but I don't see any other hands going up. Uh, one question I had for you, um, 
not not necessarily re related to Thoreau, but um, you did mention that um, part of the the wildlife refuge, of course, is um, still um, closed to the public. Are there any? Um, I'm sure you know it would be way in the future, but are there any future plans to open that section of the uh, the you know the quote that that section of the? I, I think the answer is no. You have to remember that this site was a Superfund cleanup site, just to get it to the point where it is now. And the reason there was no consideration for example, to selling it for realtors is it, it was still too, still too contaminated for housing, hence a wildlife refuge. But I, I, I've not heard anything about the, any intention to open up more of it to, uh, um, to the public. Sure. Right. Okay. So if we have no more questions, I'm gonna do five minutes of some of those extended quotes of throw from walking. I'm hoping you're willing to stay, but I can understand that it may be time to go. So let's start out with that longer one about his, his charge to people about if you're ready to take a walk. It goes this way, it is true. We are but faint-hearted crusaders, even the walkers nowadays undertake no persevering, never ending enterprises. Our expeditions are but tours and come round again at evening to the old hearth side from which we set out. Half the walk is but retracing our steps. We should go forth on the shortest walk perchance in a spirit of undying adventure, never to return, per prepare to send back our embalmed hearts only as relics to our desolate kingdoms. If you are ready to leave father and mother and brother and sister and your wife and child and friends and never see them again, if you have paid your debts and made your will and settled all your affairs and are a free man, then you are ready for a walk. He then goes on to talk about how he feels about his need for walking compared to the other people of Concord. And you have to realize Thoreau at all times decided that he was right. And if you just sat down with him long enough, he would explain to you why he was right and that you were probably wrong. He says, I think that I cannot preserve my health and spirits unless I spend four hours a day at least. And it's commonly more than that sauntering through the woods and over the hills and fields, absolutely free from all worldly engagements. When sometimes are reminded that the mechanics and shopkeepers stay in their shops, not only all the forenoon, but all the afternoon too, sitting with crossed legs, so many of them, as if legs were made to sit upon and not to stand or walk upon, I think that they deserve some credit for not having all committed suicide long ago. So Thoreau's right, everyone who sits all day is wrong. But however, he wants to say, and again, here's Thoreau pontificating, the walking I speak of has nothing in it akin to taking exercise, that is so-called, as the sick take medicine at stated hours, as the swinging of dumbbells or chairs or Indian clubs, but is it itself the enterprise and adventure of the day? If you could exercise, go in search of the springs of life, Think of a man swinging dumbbells for his health when those springs are bubbling up in far off pastures unsought by him. He also says, I'm alarmed when it happens I've walked a mile into the woods bodily without getting there in spirit. In my afternoon walk, I would fain forget all my morning occupations uh, and my obligations to society, but it sometimes happens I cannot easily shake off the village. The thought of some work would run in my head and I am not where my body is. I am out of my senses. In my walks, I would fain return to my senses. What business have I in the woods if I'm thinking of something out of the woods? Two points here. When we talk about Thoreau and pencils, not only did he develop this concept of binding it with clay, but he realized that the finer the graphite was, the better the pencil. So he developed a milling process that had the mill at the bottom in sort of a wooden tower, about six or eight feet tall, with a shelf at the top and a gentle fan blowing, powered by the same thing, powering the mill, blowing upward. So the mill continually ground the graphite, blew only the finest dust up to the top where it resided on the shelf. And then at the end of each day, someone would come in and scrape that finely ground graphite off the shelf. And that and only that would be incorporated into his pencils. And this was his own invention and his own secret procedure for making award-winning pencils. So again, he had skill. He was a mechanic, he was an inventor, but he, he saw it as a means to an end, not a means to enrich. Um, the other thing about him being a naturalist, he was extremely taken with Darwin. He, it was the voyage of the Beagle that inspired him to spend a lot more time 
observing nature. And it really changed the nature of his draft of Walden from early on, which was much more philosophical, to the final product, which was much more of being a naturalist and observer. Uh, now, this occurred far before uh, Darwin's work on, on the evolution of species, but Thoreau was still alive and with us when that book came out. And he was fascinated with this idea that it matched so much of what his own thinking had been. Even in his essay, Walking, he mentions that an oak tree each year puts out tens of thousands of acorns, and maybe only one gets to a tree. What makes that acorn special? So he, was, he had a bit of a glimmer of this idea of the competition of nature. Now, what he said about sauntering, he says sauntering, which word is beautifully derived from the idle person who roved around the country in the Middle Ages and asked for charity under pretense of going a la sainte as in the person was wandering around Europe saying, I'm going to the Holy Land, I'm going to Santer, I'm going to the Holy Land, and I'm begging for money and for food and a place to stay for the night. To the turn explained, there goes a sauntero, there goes a saunterer, someone wandering around with no occupation and, and getting by on begging. And that's how we got to the word saunterer. So two more at present, he wants to say in this vicinity, meeting Concord, the best part of the land is not yet private property. The landscape is not owned and the walker enjoins comparative freedom. He's concerned that the day may come when it'll be partioned off into so-called pleasure grounds. There'll be official walks and everything else will be privatized in which a few will take the narrow and exclusive pressure, pleasure only, only the ones who own that land will be able to walk on that land where fences shall be multiplied and walking over the surface of God's earth shall be construed to mean trespassing on some gentleman's grounds. To enjoy a thing exclusively is common to exclude yourself from the true enjoyment of it. Let us improve our opportunities then before the evil days come. So he was looking forward to this point where all land was owned and, and paths were narrow. He also, by the way, had not actually seen asphalt, but he had heard about it and read about it. And he said he would rather have not been born than to imagine the time you might be limited to walking on asphalt paths. So keep that in mind when you head out in Maynard, you realize, yes, there's the rail trail, but there's also all the wood trails to explore. And lastly, he's, he said, even in the 1850s, he says, my vicinity offers many good walks. And though for so many years, I've walked almost every day and sometimes for several days together, I have not yet exhausted them. An absolutely new prospect is a great happiness and I can still get this any afternoon. That was his life. And that what gave him uh, contentment. And thank you so much for joining me today. All right, thank you, David. Um, again, just for anybody that uh, joined us late, I'll be sending out the, uh, the link to the recording tomorrow. Uh, you should have that in your emails. And uh, hopefully we'll all see you here in a, a little over a month for um, Maynard Schools. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, have a great night.